Oh, no. 
Christ that was paid for us. As we take this today, I just ask you just to meditate on the word of God and let it penetrate on your hearts as we honor the sacrifice that was made for us this morning.
God, today. God, you're a hope. God, we believe, as your word says, that you went into the grave, but on the third day you rose. That death could not hold you. And God, because of that, today we can live lives that are more than victorious through Christ Jesus. That we can be more than calm. And so today we repent of the sin in our lives and the things in our life that separates us from you. We repent, and today, this morning, God, we remember the price that was paid that makes that even possible. Because we understand there would be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood, not just any blood, but the perfect blood, the perfect spotless lamb, your son. So today... We give you thanks as we take this communion. We repent of our sins, God, and we turn our hearts to you. That we were once lost, but now we are found. We were blind, but now we now we see. That we are no longer slaves, but we are children of the Most High. We worship you in the name of Jesus today.
children of the King, amen. Amen. Today we begin with a sign. Not one in the sky. Well, it was lifted up to the sky. A sign. A sign that was a sign. This sign was posted by the Roman governor named Pilate. This sign was a sign, a sign of absolute, unstoppable, irrefutable truth. This is the sign. John chapter 19, verse 19. And Pilate posted a sign over him, over Jesus, that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek, so that many people could read the sign. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, written in multiple languages outside of Jerusalem. Why? Why? Why the sign? There were events taking place that day outside of Jerusalem <coughs> that were outside the power of man. Supernatural events. The sign was conceived long before this event. Pilate posts the sign, if it were done in English, and you heard the languages, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, but I don't think you all read a lot of Hebrew, Latin, or Greek. So I made one out of English. Why did Pilate put this above the cross? Why? You see, the, you need to understand that this was actually conceived at conception. If you think that Pilate just did it because he was angry at the Jewish mob, you'd be wrong. This sign that was posted was a sign that was even at the conception of Christ. Are you aware of that? Even at conception, this sign was actually written some 33, more than 33 years earlier in advance. I want you to know that while Pilate was a child, this sign was already being held up. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Even at conception, this sign, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, was going to be held up. The sign was actually written before the Virgin Mary conceived the Son of God. This sign was announced long before Pilate became the governor of Judea. The sign. Session 38 of 43. We've got six more to go to finish the Gospel of John. 43 total sessions. The sign. It was written long before this event. In fact, I want to do something to begin today. I want to go back to look at the sign that will announce the sign. Gabriel, the angel of God, the messenger angel of God, will appear to a virgin named Mary. And he will post a sign. Here it comes. Luke 1, 29. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be very great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. Do you see the sign? Gabriel's looking at Mary and said, the Lord God's going to give this baby that's not even conceived yet the throne of his ancestor David. Oh, there's more. And he will reign over Israel. How long? How long? Forever. And his kingdom will never end. 
Did you ever imagine that Gabriel in this event is posting a sign? Much like the sign that Herod, po- excuse me, that, that Pilate posts over top of the cross of Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you, I have kind of a, I don't know how to describe it. I've looked for the word to, I, I grew up in the church and a frustration. Let me just call it a frustration. I, I've been in the church since I was born. I have been taken to church. I have never in my life been outside of the church. And all my life in the church as a child, I heard the story about the angel Gabriel coming to Mary. But here's my frustration. The angel Gabriel told Mary five things. I just read them to you. And my frustration is in my church youth, the only thing that I was ever taught was the first two. Nobody ever told me about three, four, and five. Why? I don't know what your church history is, but I find it frustrating that I was raised in the church and nobody ever told me about three, four, and five. What was number one? You will conceive a child. You'll give birth to a child. You'll name him Jesus. Well, we talked about that all the time. He will be, called, he will be great and called the Son of the Most High. We talked about that all the time. Well, why didn't anybody tell me the next thing? The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. Nobody ever told me that God was going to give this baby the throne of David. And the next thing it says is he's going to reign over the house of Jacob, Israel, forever. And number five, his kingdom will never end. I feel a little frustrated that they left out some of the biggest part of the angel announcement. I'm going to ask you a question. Did you read the sign? I don't want you to come to this church and only hear number one and number two. I want you to, I want you to read the entire sign that was posted by Gabriel. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That's what Pilate put up. And Gabriel put it up way before Pilate did. Did you read the sign? Understand this, that David was the king of the Jews. Yes. Jesus was announced by Pilate. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. David was the king of the Jews. But that was a thousand years before the cross. David reigned over all of Israel. Understand something about David's kingdom. It was not the divided kingdom of Judah and Israel. No, it was the united kingdom. All the tribes under King David. He ruled over as king over all of Israel. But David died. And his kingdom came to an end. But Mary is going to have a son and he's going to sit on David's throne and he's going to reign over Israel forever. How's that possible? Did anyone tell you about this sign? This sign that was posted over the cross. This sign revealed by the angel Gabriel himself. A forever kingdom. Did Pilate know about Gabriel's announcement? How could he know? Why did Pilate put up this sign? Why did he write it in multiple languages? Did you read the sign of Gabriel? posted in the Bible? Did you read the sign of Pilate posted in the Bible? How many people know the Christmas story of Mary and the angel Gabriel, but you've got no clue about the sign? Did they read it? Back to the scene, Pilate posts this so that multiple languages and multiple people would see it. I'm going to ask you a question. Did they believe it? Did they read it? Did they believe it? And did they like it? It's a relevant question even today. Did they they believe it when they saw it? Did they become angry when they saw it? Verse 21. Let's look. Then the leading priest, after Pilate posts the sign, the leading priest objected and said to Pilate, Change it from the king of the Jews to, he said, I am king of the Jews. No. Did they like it? No. Change it. 
Here the Jews are telling Pilate to change it. We don't want Jesus to be our king. We want you to change the wording to he says he's the king. But we don't believe that he's the king. They said change it. We already have a king. His name is Caesar. Change it. We like it better when we get to write our own sign. And we get to pick our own king. But I ask you again, why did Pilate post the son, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. And why did the Jews hate the son? Why did they want it changed or taken down? Do you think everyone is going to like the son? The sign is still posted today. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Do you think everybody is going to like the sign, believe the sign, accept the sign? The Roman governor, Pilate, put up the sign, but 33 years earlier, King Herod tried to take the sign down. Gabriel had put up the sign, he will be great and called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob and his kingdom will never end. Gabriel posted the sign, and shortly thereafter, King Herod tried to take the sign down. You see, this sign, what's the problem with the sign? Why do people dislike the sign, want the sign to be taken down, null or void? So much controversy about the sign. Don't miss the sign. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Why did Herod try to take it down? Matthew 2, 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem. And guess what they're bringing? A sign. They arrived in Jerusalem, these wise men, these magi, and they asked, where is this newborn King of the Jews. How did they know? Did they read the sign? Isn't it interesting? That's the same thing that Pilate will say at the end of Jesus' life. Where is this newborn King of the Jews? We, have, we saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. And King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. Why is Herod disturbed? Why is it that you can post this sign, there is a king of the Jews, and people start getting nervous? Why? I can tell you why Herod got nervous, because Herod was the king of the Jews. At least he thought he was. The Magi were following a sign, which was the star, while they were carrying a sign. What? A verbal announcement that there was a newborn king of the Jews. Can you take this King of the Jews sign down? Is it possible? Many have tried. They didn't like it when Pilate put it up. Herod didn't like it when the Magi delivered the sign to Jerusalem. Can you take the sign down? Herod tried to take the sign down. He killed all the baby boys, all the boys, two years old and under, to do what? No, don't be confused, to do what? To try to take down this sign. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Can you do it? Can you take the sign down? It was posted by Gabriel. It was posted by the wise men. And Herod says, I'll take the sign down. I'll stop the sign. Can you do it? Can anyone stop it? Pilate had met Jesus face to face. And he interviewed him before he made this sign. In fact, in that interview, Pilate asked the question that everyone will eventually have to answer. Here we go, Matthew 27, 11. When Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor asked this question, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you? Jesus replied, you have said it. Some things are unstoppable. 
I'm going to tell you today, this sign is unstoppable. The angel Gabriel announced it direct from God 33 plus years before the cross. The wise men from the east announced it. They saw the sign in the stars after the birth of Jesus. In fact, God announced it himself to King David a thousand years in advance. Do you know that? It's found in 1 Kings chapter 2. As the time of King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. I want you to understand the context. David is about to die. He's reaching that age. He calls in his son Solomon who will succeed him as king of Israel. In verse 2, David said, I am going where everyone on earth must someday go. Take courage, Solomon, my son, and be a man. Good advice today for fathers to their sons. Take courage and be a man. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commands, and regulations and laws written in the law of Moses so that you'll be successful in all you do and wherever you go. And if you do this, here it comes, and Solomon, my son, the future king of Israel, and if you do this, the Lord will keep the promise he made to me. What was the promise God made to David? He told me, if your descendants live as they should and follow me faithfully with all their heart and soul. Here it comes. One of them, one of your descendants, David, will always sit on the throne in Israel. Solomon was faithful for a while. The kings from David's seed were faithful for a while. Some of them anyway. But eventually the kings from David's seed, the kings from David's lineage became unfaithful and God did what God does. God brought judgment. You see, with God, holiness must always confront unholiness. Some 500 years after the time of King David, 21 kings later, 21 kings later came the final king of Judah. His name was Zedekiah. It was 586 B.C. and God's righteous judgment had come to Judah and Jerusalem. The Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar took King Zedekiah and he took all of King Zedekiah's sons. Do you understand what King Zedekiah's sons represent? They represent the remaining lineage of the seed of David. Nebuchadnezzar has sacked Jerusalem. He takes the king, Zedekiah, gathers all of his boys around him, and one, of the, one at a time kills all of Zedekiah's sons while Zedekiah watches. And then he turns and puts out both of Zedekiah's eyes. Do you know what just happened? Nebuchadnezzar just ended the reign of David. Or he thought he did. Can you stop this sign? Take it down? The kingdom of David ended that day. Or did it? King Nebuchadnezzar took the sign down that day. Or did he? The people of Israel were not faithful to God. And guess what happened? God's judgment did come. But God was faithful to David. Please listen to what I'm about to say. You see, if you study that scripture in, in Kings, he says, Solomon, if you are faithful, God will never stop putting one of our children on the throne in Israel. But they were unfaithful. What's God going to do? David's family, those 21 kings, the people of Israel were not faithful. Listen, listen. But God is. But God is faithful. God had made a promise to David, and God always keeps his promises. Let me read it again. 1 Kings 2, verse 4. God said to David, if you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise he made to me. He's actually, 
David's talking to Solomon. If you do this, be faithful. The Lord will keep his promise he made to me. What's the promise? He told me, if your descendants live as they should and follow me faithfully with all their heart and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne in Israel. Even before King Zedekiah died, even before the royal seat of David was put to death by Nebuchadnezzar, God has posted a son. Roughly 130 years before Jerusalem would fall and the royal line of David through Zedekiah would fall, God made an announcement through the prophet Isaiah. A sign would be posted in all eternity, revealing, listen, the faithfulness of God to keep the sign. It's found in Isaiah 7, verse 13. Then Isaiah said, listen well, you royal family of David. Who's he talking to? He's talking about the lineage of David. Listen well, you royal family of King David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right then, the Lord himself will give you a son. The Lord himself will give you a son. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Did you read the sign? Did they? Do you understand this sign? Because this sign lights up the sign that Pilate put over the cross. What Isaiah prophesied, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Do you understand this sign lights up the sign that Pilate put on the cross? How did it begin? Listen, you royal family of David. The Lord himself will post a sign. A virgin will conceive a son. And he will not be an ordinary son. His name is Emmanuel. Did you read the sign? Do you understand this sign? It was posted in 730, roughly 730 B.C. God was going to do what David's son could never do. Listen, listen, listen. God was about to do what none of David's sons would ever be able to do. Reign in Jerusalem with righteousness and justice forever. Nobody can do it. So God will do it himself. He's posting a sign. This king would come from the lineage of David. This king would come from a new seed, a supernatural seed. This king would not come from Adam's seed. And actually, this king would not come from David's seed, but he would still be from David's lineage. This king would come from the very seed of God. And what I'm about to tell you now, I hope is a light bulb moment to you because it has been for me for many years. Here it comes. When you study the scriptures, one thing stands out above everything else. Of all the billions of people who have ever lived on planet Earth, there is only one whose father's 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 father is not Adam. One. Do you know why the virgin birth is so important? Because the virgin birth proves there was only one who did not come from the seed of Adam. One. And God said what? I will post a sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This son, this virgin's son, is going to become the king that will reign with justice and righteousness. How will he be able to do it? Because he's not from the flawed seed of Adam. He's from a new seed. Is he from the lineage of David? Yes, but not from the seed of David, not from the seed of Adam. Nope, it's a new seed. 
the seed of God, Emmanuel. This king would be able to do what no other king has ever done. He will reign with justice and righteousness over the house of Jacob, the people of Israel, the children of God. This king is God with us, Emmanuel. This king is the king of the Jews, like David, but much greater, because this king is eternal. I don't really know how much Pontius Pilate knew or didn't know. In fact, the question is, what did he know that made him put that sign on the cross? I don't know. The sign, I know this. The sign that he posted that day above the cross is absolute truth. I have no idea if that was his intention or not, but it is absolute truth. And if you don't like that sign, it is still absolute truth. And if you want somebody to take that sign down, it is still absolute truth. And if you want somebody to rewrite the sign to say, he said he was the king of the Jews, the original sign would still be absolute truth. You see, this sign is in all languages. For this sign is for every tribe and tongue and nation. This sign is our hope. This sign is our salvation. Our hope and our salvation rest fully upon the King of the Jews. This sign is the announcement of God's perfect love. God's faithfulness come to earth. This sign is the dividing line for all mankind. Jesus in the middle of two thieves. This sign will divide nations. This sign will divide families. This sign reveals that there was a king on Jerusalem's cross that day. This sign reveals that Jesus died that day as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. This sign reveals that Jesus is coming back. <clears throat> That's why I'm frustrated that I grew up in the church that never told me anything beyond the birth of Christ in Gabriel's announcement. This sign proves that Jesus is coming back and he's going to go into Jerusalem and he's going to sit on David's throne and he's going to reign over the house of Jacob and he's going to establish a kingdom that will never end. How is it that you would believe the first two promises of Gabriel, but you would reject the rest of the promises as figurative language? How is it? Did you read the sign? Can you fight the sign, stop the sign? In my mind are the words of Gabriel. You will give birth to a son and name him Jesus. Everybody likes to talk about it. We talk about it all the time. We should talk about it all the time. He will be great and called the Son of the Most High. We talk about that all the time. You're singing songs about that. But church, do you realize that's only two of the five announcements of Gabriel? I'm going to ask you, do you did you read this sign of Gabriel that Pilate reposted? Why? Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now that goes to the third announcement of Gabriel. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. Jesus is going to get a throne. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, did you see Jesus on a throne? He is right now on a throne at the right hand of the Father. But I'm asking you, where is the throne of David? In heaven? No, it's in Jerusalem. That would kind of change your worldview, wouldn't it? Then in the future, there is an event that is going to take place. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. He will reign over the house of Jacob. He will reign over Israel. David reigned over Israel. Jesus is going to reign over Israel. And finally, it says his kingdom will never end. I'll ask you a question. The sign that Gabriel posted and announced to Mary, written in this book. Do you believe the sign? 
Have you read the signs? Do you anticipate the revelation of the signs? Now back to Pilate and his sign. Verse 19. And Pilate posted a sign over him that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek so that many people could read it. Then the leading priest objected and said to Pilate, Change it from the king of the Jews to, He said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate replied, No. No. What I have written, I have written. You can't take this sign down. It's too late. It's unstoppable. That sign was posted for the world to see, for the world to read, so that the world would know. That sign reveals that Jesus is the King of the Jews. Do you know what that means, really? Are you sure? Do you know what that really means? Jesus is King. Listen, don't misquote me on what I'm about to say. Jesus is King over a certain group of people. Pay attention. Jesus is king over a certain group of people. He will not be king over all people. Why? Because many people will reject him as their king. Jesus did not and has not become king by force. Not yet. He has not and did not become king by force. No, just the opposite. Jesus became a king by submitting to the Father's will, by submitting to the command of God. And what was the command of God? You will die on a tree. Now you have a choice regarding this king. Will you bow to this king? He will be a king over a certain group of people. Stay with me. He will be a king over a certain group of people. The sign says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. He will be a king over a certain group of people. I'm going to ask you, will you, have you bowed to this king? What happens if you do and what happens if you don't? I think that would be important in the decision about bowing down to him. Did you read the sign? I want to read this part to you. Now, listen carefully. When I said he will be a king over a certain group of people, some of your eyebrows raised because you want to know where I'm going with that. I'm going to let the scriptures explain the point. In John chapter 1, verse 10, listen to what he says. He came to the very world he created. Now, that's Jesus being born of a virgin. He came from heaven to the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize Jesus, did it? No? He came to his own people. Now, who would that be? That'd be the Jews. And even they rejected him. But to all who believed him. Do you believe he's the king of the Jews? To all who accepted him. Have you accepted him as Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews? To all who believed him, to all who accepted him, he gave the right, here it comes, to become something. Something that you're not until you do. He gave you the right to become the children of God. What are the Jewish people? Spiritually speaking, what are the Jewish people? The children of God. It's not my phrase. It's the phrase in the Holy Scripture. He will be king over a certain group of people. A group of people who will receive him and believe him and accept him as what? As the king of the Jews. Is he the king of the Jews? You see, he gives you the right to become the children of God. You've heard me say over the years this statement. Everyone is God's creation, but not everyone is God's child. So when you hear some religious person say, we're all God's children, he's a liar. Because we're not all God's children. We all are God's creation, yes. But you know who the children of God are? Those who receive this Messiah as their king. They are the children of God. Listen, but to all who believed him and all who accepted him, he gave the right. He gives you the right to do what you could not do. Become a child of God. They are reborn. 
Born of the water, born of the Spirit, born again. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. How? By faith. By faith in what? I believe that Jesus is indeed the King of the Jews. This king has given you, uh, you and I the right to become a child of God. Believing in this king and accepting Jesus as king gives you the right to join the family of God as a child of God. And what if you don't? What if you reject this king? If we receive him by faith, what if by faith you reject him? What if you refuse to believe, you refuse to accept? What is at stake here? Did you read the sign? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth. Listen, listen, listen. He's not just talking about birds here. He says, everyone who acknowledges me here publicly on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. What? Is Jesus your king? Are you apologizing when you go to work about your king? Do you make excuses for your king? Or do you acknowledge openly that Jesus is your king? Verse 34, don't imagine that I came to bring peace on the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father. A daughter against her mother. And a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own house. Why? Not everyone will accept the son. Would you deny your king? No one would deny their king. Actually, to deny Jesus is because you really don't believe he's a king. Because if you really believed he was your king, you would never deny him. Did you read the sign? Are you afraid of what people will say to you if you bow down to King Jesus where you work? Are you afraid what people are going to say to you if you carry this sign above your life that your life cries out, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, my King? Are you, are you afraid of what the public will say about you if you demonstrate such a sign above your life? Our King was revealed to the world by a cross. And you and I have been called to carry a cross. Did you read the sign? Matthew 10, 37. Jesus said, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. And if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Did you read the sign? My name is Terry Cooper. And Jesus is my king. I have bowed my life to him. Not in reluctance, but out of great joy and gladness. I desire with all my heart to belong to this king and his kingdom. I have no regrets. I recognize this truth. If life like a ball game has four quarters, I'm in the fourth quarter. And I can look back at my life in the first and second and third quarter and where I am now in the fourth quarter and I can say this. I have no regrets regarding this decision to bow to this king. Do you know why? Because I have read the sign. 
this sign is from God and this sign is absolute truth. In fact, I've been reading the signs to you all morning from this book. I'll ask you again, did you read the sign? Do you believe the sign? They crucified the king of glory. Did you read that sign? He died to pay off your sin debt so that you could become a child of God. Did you read that sign? They divided his garments to fulfill a sign. Everything written has to happen exactly. You know the future. Did you read the sign? Do you believe the sign? Do you submit your life to the authority of the sign? Interesting to me that after Pilate posts the sign, after the Jews say, take it down or change it, there's another sign-fulfilling event that takes place. Verse 23, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. This fulfilled the scripture that says, they divided my garments among themselves and threw dice for my clothing So that is what they did. The soldiers, they have no clue that they're fulfilling the signs from Psalms 22. Pilate has no idea that he's just saying what Gabriel said years ago when he puts his sign. But when the soldiers throw dice for the garments of Jesus, they're fulfilling Psalms 22. And here's the part that just makes my heart cry out. You know who wrote Psalms 22? David. Who's he writing it about? The coming king that will sit on his throne. Let me read it to you. Psalms 22, 16. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I count all my bones. I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and they throw dice for my clothing. A thousand years before the cross. Did you read the sign? Everything written in the signs about Jesus is going to happen. It is unstoppable. Did you read the sign? Luke 22, Jesus says this, For the time has come for this prophecy about me to be fulfilled. He was accounted among the rebels. Yes, everything written about me by the prophets will come true. This is what Jesus told his followers after the resurrection. Luke 24, 44, He said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then Jesus did something that only he can do. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He's the only one that can do it. Nobody can do it for you. Only he can do it. You can't do it for yourself. Verse 45, then he, Jesus, opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It is also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. Did you read the sign? Everything written is going to happen. It's unstoppable. Did you bow to this king? Have you rejected this king? I know what's coming for those who reject Jesus as the king of the Jews. I can tell you today what's going to happen if you reject Jesus as king. I'm going to read to you Revelation 6, 15. This is the description of the group of people that refuse to bow to Jesus, the King of the Jews. Revelation 6, 15. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person, they all hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Why are they all hiding? king is coming and they cried to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come 
and who is able to survive? Let me ask you, who will survive that? You know the answer. Notice the contrast of that group to Revelation 19. Because Revelation 19 describes those who have bowed to Jesus as the king. Revelation 19, 6. Then I heard again what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of a mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to Him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And the, His bride, the church, has prepared herself. How did you prepare yourself? You believe that He is indeed who He says He is. The church has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words that come from God. Then I fell down at the angel's feet to worship him, but he said, No, don't worship me. I am a servant of God, just like you and your brothers and sisters who testify about their faith in Jesus. Worship only God. For the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. The difference between the people hiding in Revelation 6 and the people celebrating in Revelation 19 is this. They read the sign. And they believed the sign. What sign? John 19, 19. And Pilate posted a sign over him that read Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That truth has been proclaimed around the world for the past 2,000 years. The forces of darkness have tried to stop that sign from being posted all around the world, but they have failed. This gospel, this sign of God, will be preached until the end. And then. Let me read to you about the end and then. Matthew 24, 14. Jesus reveals this. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that every nation, so that all the nations will hear it. And then what? And then what? The end will come. Vice President Pence was in Jerusalem this past week. And do you know why? Do you care? They are trying to decide who gets Jerusalem as their capital. The Jews, the Palestinians. Who gets Jerusalem as their capital? Our president proclaimed Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel a few weeks ago, and now everyone seems to be upset. Well, almost everyone. The king of Jordan told Vice President Pence this past week that East Jerusalem must be the capital of the new Palestinian state. The Palestinian leaders have refused, did refuse, to meet with our vice president because they said openly, and it was covered in the news, that he has a messianic complex, that all he wants to talk about is the coming Messiah. Everyone wants their capital in Jerusalem. Seems like everyone wants to be involved in the decision to determine the boundaries of Israel. Why would anybody care? Did you read the sign? Here's the words you hear on the news, though I find very few people actually know what it means. The 1967 borders. The occupied territory. The West Bank. The Gaza Strip. East Jerusalem. Everyone seems to have an opinion on every one of those words. Can I give you the truth today? Jesus is going to make Jerusalem his capital. I read the sign. Jerusalem is going to be his throne. I read the sign. The angel Gabriel told the Virgin Mary before the conception of Jesus in her womb that the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob and his kingdom will never end. 
I don't know what's going to happen between now and then. I really don't. And by the way, can I say this? Yes, I believe that Vice President Pence is Messianic. And you know what that means? He is an evangelical Christian. And if you don't know what that means, it simply means he believes the Bible to be literal. And he believes that Jesus is the King of the Jews and that he is going to come back and he is going to come to Jerusalem. And he stood in front of Knesset, the Israeli parliament, and said all of those things. And one of the Israeli parliament leaders afterwards was quoted as saying, did he come, to, did he come as the Messiah or did he come as the vice president of the United States? I can't tell. Why is the American vice president in Jerusalem speaking to parliament and he keeps bringing up the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah? I'm not going to pretend today that I've got all this figured out. I don't. I study to find out and learn what I can. But I can tell you this, I've read the signs. I'm going to read to you, and I'll wrap it up, Zechariah 12.1. I believe what's happening right now is this. Zechariah 12, 1, this message concerning the fate of Israel came from the Lord. This message is from the Lord who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundations of the earth, and formed the human spirit. God said, I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger. When they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah, on that day, I don't, I don't know what day that is. On that day, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. All the nations will gather against it and try to move it, but they'll only hurt themselves. Did you read the sign about the king of the Jews? He's going to return to Jerusalem and he's going to sit on David's throne. Now today in this room, you probably like me were raised in a church in which they focused heavily on the first two of Gabriel's marvelous eternal announcements, but maybe you like me didn't get the rest of the story. So I'm going to tell you the story. He is going to stand on the Mount of Olives and he's going to walk through the Kidron Valley. He's going to go through the Eastern Gate and he's going to sit on David's throne. And he's going to reign with an iron scepter with justice and righteousness over the house of Jacob. And when it begins, it will never end. Did you read the sign? Now what's interesting is what's happening even today in Jerusalem points to at least, even if you're an unbeliever in the room today, you'd have to say, that's interesting. But there's another sign. In Zechariah, the same prophet Chapter 14, verse 6, he says, on that day. By the way, if you read the first verses, his feet stand on the Mount of Olives. And on that day, the sources of light will no longer shine. Yet there will be continuous day. Only the Lord knows how this could happen. There will be no normal day and night, for at evening time, the, there will still be light. Ha, there's a new light in town. At evening time, it'll still be light. On that day, life-giving water will flow out from where? Washington, D.C.? Not going to happen. Life-giving water will flow out from Jerusalem, half toward the Dead Sea and half toward the Mediterranean, flowing continuously in both summer and winter. And the Lord will be what? The king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord. His name alone will be worshipped. I'm not going to wait for that day. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to worship him today. He is the king of the Jews. He is my king. I don't need any more signs. I'm not going to ask Jesus to give me any more signs because I've read this from Jesus himself. The word of God is sufficient sign for me. The cross of Christ is a sufficient sign for me. In fact, one last scripture, they asked Jesus, give me another sign and I'll believe you're the king of the Jews. Matthew 16, 1. On that day, the, one day the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, demanding that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. 
He replied, you know the saying, red sky at night means fair weather tomorrow. Red sky in the morning means foul weather all day. You thought that was a wives' tale. That's in the Bible. You know how to interpret the weather signs in the sky, but you, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. Right now, today, is what's going on in Jerusalem. Can you interpret the signs of the times? Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign, but the only sign I will give them, the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. And Jesus left them and he went on. What is the sign of the prophet Jonah? Three days he is in the belly of the fish. And at the end of three days, he comes out alive. Who do you know? I'm going to ask you, who do you know that has risen from the dead on the third day? Go ahead, give me a name. Jesus. You want another sign? You want another one besides this one? It's written in every tribe, tongue, and language. It's going to be preached around the world. Today, I'm going to close with this, simply this. My name is Terry Cooper. And Jesus is my king. I hold this sign. I'm going to post this sign over my life. I'm going to live so that everyone who comes to know who I am, they're going to know who my king is. It's not going to take you days to figure it out. I'm going to tell you in a very short order that I am a follower of this king. His name is Jesus. And if somebody looks at me and says, you know what, why don't you change the sign to say he said he was the king of the Jews. I said, no, I can't change the sign because I know he's the king of the Jews. I read the signs. And I'm not going to take this sign down. And if this sign offends you, I'm not holding this sign up to offend you. I'm holding this sign up to save your life. That he is the king of the Jews. I'll ask Chad to come out for the invitation. Is you your king? Have you bowed your knee to him? Does your life demonstrate to those around you who he is? Can anybody look at you and say their king is Jesus Christ? The most important thing in their life is Jesus Christ. I've said for years this. Father specifically, you know the greatest thing you will ever do for your children or grandchildren? Here it comes. That if you get their kids, their grandkids off to the side, if, they could, if you could ask them a question, what's the most important thing in your dad, your granddad's life? If they would immediately say, he loves the Lord with all his heart. That would be the greatest gift you will ever give your family. Is that true today? Your kids, call them off the side. What's the biggest thing in your daddy's life? What would they say? You see, you're holding up a sign. It's being read by everyone around you. Is it this sign? The invitation's open. Stand. His body bound and drenched in tears.
words. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. This here is Axel Crest. Axel has been in the youth group for quite a few years now, and uh, he's decided to give his life to the Lord. So, Axel, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. I believe, I believe that, Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I accept him now as my Lord and my Savior. Axel, have you repented of your sins? Mm -hmm. All right. Axel... <laughs> Because of your good confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, resurrection. You pray with me. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the witnesses that have gone before us, that have given us a testimony about the truth so that we would know. We can know who we are. We know who you are. We know what the future holds. We know about heaven. We know about hell. We know about salvation. We know about the cross. We know because you posted signs all around us. You told us by faith we could read these signs. And the Holy Spirit 
would unveil our eyes so we can see the signs and understand your scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Only you can open our eyes, our hearts, our ears. So, Father, I pray for your church, for this one today who has confessed with his mouth that Jesus is Lord, believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead. Father, may he experience this new birth in Christ. Father, upon your church, I pray this blessing. Upon your church, make us strong and very courageous. May we never take down this sign of who Jesus is. May we never apologize, but may we give our lives as a living testimony of the glory of this Christ that you have sent. Emmanuel, God with us. Send us out into this dark world with this light of hope. I pray this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here today.